Praise the Lord. Dewa nama itu mahat mandat eh. Dewa itu indah suci sesuatu yang ninggal lelalar deh monil. Orang kelu kelu nilai kain ini kawas seram nalgi ada nanya dewa itu nanti baru ini. And special thanks to Achin for encouraging me to speak from the Word of God. Inna te nama kita dihan itu nai. I have chosen the portion that was read as today's episode. Matthew chapter five verses thirteen to sixteen. So let me just read selected verses from it. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Enda waktu yang kau dan enda wajin yang matram, enda kunjungal dah hidup dengan le perwata kena le yakin. Let these words of my mouth be pleasing in your sight. Everything in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So the theme decided by the church today for today's meditation is life for the glory of God. So throughout our readings today, we've seen that our lives are designed for a purpose much greater than ourselves. Nampaknya jiwadam, nampaknya kal mahatteramaya ulakshetin aitana jubagalpana cederi kena. Berada nilnilkan ni di matra malla, marcha dewatin te mahatwam pragashi pikan ana. Vishudya ayreniya sorikel parnya do bolle, dewatin te mahatwam ennal enna da, purnamai jiwan ulla uru manusia ana. Dewa mahatetin ay purnamai jiwi kiga enna dinte artha menda ana nampaknoka. So I have three uh, questions for our brief collective study together, and we'll meditate on the answers from our readings today. Question number one, who are we? Question two, what are we supposed to do? What are we expected to do? And question number three, how should we do it? So the, our very first question of the day, who are we? Or um, going further into it, what is our identity? So let me first answer that by saying, by first telling you who we are not. In a world that is often defining us by external factors, our achievements, our physical appearances, our talents, our money, our influence, our friend circles, and so many other uh, dot, dot, dots, right? We are not any of those things. So let me first tell you what we are not. And there is a pressure to look a certain way, to act in a certain way, to have achievements in a certain way by a certain age, especially in the Indian community, to have achievements at by certain ages. You know, you finish school, you gotta finish college, and maybe after college, masters. By a certain age, you're supposed to have that. By a certain age, you're supposed to have a job. By a certain age, you're supposed to get married. By a certain age, you're have, supposed to have one kid, two kids, all of that. You know, it's, it's created for us. So there is that pressure for all of us. But the reality is, when we are going through all that pressures, uh, we often forget who we truly are, or why we are created. Namal yatharta til aar ananno, alengil endi naan namal ay srishti ke petanno namal palapooru marnu bovnu. So our identity is not rooted in our achievements, status, or worldly possessions. Instead, it is firmly established in our relationship with Christ. In fact, our true identity is found in Christ alone. So only in Christ do we see our true identity. So I want you to remember or know that we are God's masterpiece. So in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works for which God prepared in advance for us to do. So this verse emphasizes the uniqueness of each believer as God's masterpiece. And the uniqueness of it. So the purpose uh, and my identity is not the same as somebody else's identity. Even if, you know, you're born in the same family, you know, same parents, same uh, situations and social conditions and all of those things, your identity in Christ is unique. Uh, uh, so to quote Rick Warren, our identity is not a product of worldly standards, but it is intricately woven into a divine design created for a purpose that aligns with God's eternal plan. So in Psalms 139 verse uh, 14, it says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So here I want to draw your attention to the word that's used here, fearfully and wonderfully made. So the word fearfully used here is actually not uh, to say that God was afraid when he was creating us. So the word used is the Hebrew word yare, for fearfully, which means to approach something or someone with great reverence, 
with heartfelt interest and deep respect. So think of that one time when you have to give your 100% attention and focus on something. It may be cooking when you, we have guests over and cooking that perfect dish, or it might be working on a project at work which needed so many co components and there was something uh, you know, very high uh, at stake. Or it might be if you are working on a painting or a picture or a song or something that you are working on with so much attention to detail. You look at it from so many different angles. That is how God created us. He looked at everything with so much wonder and well, fearfully he created us. So that is our identity, right? So then what happens if we lose or forget our identity? Okay, we know that God created us fearfully and wonderfully, but then in our life, we backslide, we make mistakes, we fall down, we stumble. So what happens if we lose or forget our identity? So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. So this verse reminds us of the transformative power of our identity in Christ. So through our faith and through our, our relationship with God, we are made new, freed from the burdens of our past, even when we mess up, even when we have all those um, stumbles and shortcomings and falls that we've had. We are called to live in the fullness of our renewed identity as children of God. Best example of that would be the transformation of Apostle Paul. Known for his persecution of Christians before his encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus. So his life radically changed. And he identified himself as a servant of Christ Jesus. Exemplifying how our identity also shifts when we encounter Christ. So Paul became from a persecutor to servant because Paul himself declares, I have been crucified with Christ and it's I who no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So he talks about the profound shift that occurs when we surrender our lives to Christ. So Paul didn't just talk about it. He, his life showed, he, it, he exemplified it through his life about the identity shift that happens when Christ becomes uh, the center. So something that is remotely closest, nothing is uh, close to it, but something that is at least very remotely close to that would be, uh, those of us can relate to this, um, who are parents can relate to this. The moment that you become a parent, because when you check into the hospital before your child is born, you are Mr. and Mrs. Matthew, or Mr. and Mrs. whoever. But then once that child is born, there is a shift that happens, and I don't think anyone can, any of us who are parents can even describe that. There is a shift that happens inside of us and our, um, our status also, because after that child is born, then you suddenly become mom and dad, especially first-time parents. You know, you go in as uh, people who do not have a child just yet, but then once a child is born, you immediately become parents, and there is that shift that happens. And then, from then on, as parents, we are not thinking of ourselves. Well, it, and that goes every, every stage, right? You're not thinking, you go shopping, you're not thinking of what you want first, you're thinking of your child. You cook something, you're thinking of your child. You, uh, you know, make your budgets, you're thinking of your child. So that is a very, um, that, that's, the, that's an example that I can give you that's a little close to what I'm talking about, your identity shift, right? But when we are in Christ, our identity is expected to be completely shifted with Christ as the center. So now I have a question for you. Is it ever too late to embrace our identity in Christ? And the short answer is never. It is never too late. Because in Christ, we are forgiven, we are loved, and we are empowered to live out God's purposes for our lives. And it is essential to constantly align our identity with the truth of who God says we are. So it is not just a one-time done deal. It's a constant, um, every day, every minute process. So through Christ, we are made new, adopted into God's family, and given purpose beyond measure. So from the Bible, we also find the story of uh, the Samaritan woman at the well. John chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 42, you see the uh, narrative and, the, and her experience. So her encounter with uh, Jesus transformed her from an outcast to a confident witness who proclaimed Christ's identity to her community, to anyone who would listen. She, she actually said, come, 
see a man who told me everything I ever did, showing how encountering Christ redefines our identity. So our first question was, who are we? And what is our identity? So our second question of the day is, what are we expected to know? Okay, now we know our identity. What should we do with that? Like, what are we supposed to do? Um, in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7, it says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So here, Isaiah beautifully captures the purpose of our existence. In short, to bring glory to God. So our very creation is intricately tied to God's desire for his glory to be manifested through our lives. And recognizing this truth gives a depth and significance to our daily endeavors. And also the question is, uh, when should we do it? When should we be giving glory to God? Like every Sunday, uh, 10 to 12, or every Friday afternoon, or what is the time? When should we give uh, glory to God? The Bible has a clear answer for that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, it says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, key emphasis on whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So this verse emphasizes the all-encompassing nature of living for God's glory. It's not a time thing that you set, set an alarm to do it or you set a reminder on your phone to do it. It's a constant process. So in every aspect of our lives, from the mundane to the extraordinary, our actions and attitudes should be directed towards magnifying the glory of our creator. So living for God's glory also means understanding that our lives are not about us. It is not I, 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 or it's not me, me, me. It is meant to showcase and magnify the character, the goodness, and the different attributes of God. So we are called to be agents of change, impacting the world around us for better. So going back to our key verse that we read today, right? You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So just as salt enhances flavor and light dispels darkness, our lives should positively influence those around us. And that involves living in a way that honors God, demonstrating his love that draws others closer to him. And it's, it's a little easy when things are going our way, when we have um, you know, no visible struggles or when we are in a comfortable place, it is easy to demonstrate God's love, that we have everything going for us. But the question is, are, you able to, are we able to demonstrate uh, God's love when it is difficult? Um, let me tell you about the story of uh, Corey Ten Boom. So Corey Ten Boom was a Dutch Christian watchmaker who lived during World War II. So she was raised in a devout Christian family. And she, but what she and her family did is they risked their lives to shelter Jews and others from the Nazis in the Netherlands. The family was eventually discovered and arrested, leading Corey to endure imprisonment at the Ravensburg uh, concentration camp. So she and her family was captured. So even in the concentration camp, she had smuggled some pages of the Bible. So after a long days of work, she would hold worship services within her prison cell after each day. So her sister, who was also imprisoned with her, um, uh, caught a disease and she died within the concentration camp. And Corey was scheduled to go to the uh, gas chambers. But by you know, miraculous divine intervention, there was uh, a clerical error and she, was she alone was miraculously released just before, um, just days before her scheduled execution date. So Corey, what she did after that is she dedicated her life post-war to spreading a message of forgiveness and reconciliation. She, she still helped out people even when she had nothing going for her. All her uh, things were uh, taken away from her, but she built her life again and she helped out people. So she and her family exemplified sacrificial love and courage rooted in their Christian faith. Sheltering Jews despite personal risk echoed the selfless love and compassion that Jesus showed us. So in her book, The, the Hiding Place, she sh uh, talks about her experiences and talks about her love that she exemplified through her life. And there's a quote from Corrie Ten Boom. It goes like this. Trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength is the most confusing, 
exhausting, and tedious of all work. But when you are filled with the Spirit, the ministry of Jesus just flows out of you. Ennal ningal parishuthaatmaavinal nirayumbol Christuvinte sushrusha ningalil ninna olugunu. The third question that I have for you. So how should we do what is expected of us? There are so many different ways to live for the glory of God. But I want to talk about uh, our theme for today. So today was uh, dedicated as a day of temperance. So I want to shine light on that. So how can we do uh, what is expected of us? One way of doing that is by living a life of temperance. So what is temperance? In the historical context, Temperance movements have been associated with efforts to promote moderation in the consumption of alcohol. So such movements have aimed to address the negative social and health consequences of alcoholism and excessive drinking. So sabhiyai innu nam lahri virutha dinamai aajirikunu. So we also read in Proverbs uh, chapter 23 verse 19 to 35 as the first lesson. So it warns against the dangers of excesses, can be drunkenness, gluttony, indulgence, and living in uh, a wrong manner. So temperance also refers to moderation, self-restraint, and balance in behavior, especially in relation to indulgence in pleasures or other excessive behavior. It can be applied to not just uh, something uh, that's related to alcoholism or drug usage or something that gives us a high. It could also be uh, used for various impacts of life, including lifestyle choices, emotions, and other personal habits. So the word of God urges us to exercise moderation and self-discipline in all areas of life, not just in avoiding substances, but in also managing our time, emotions, and desires. It cautions us against excesses that can lead to our downfall. So I want to talk about three aspects of living um, in, in temperance or living with a sense of temperance. First one is we are broken walls without it. So in Proverbs 25, verse 28 says, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. So a city without protective walls is vulnerable to external threats. And in, you know, that's a very tangible uh, example, that's a physical example. In, in, in the digital world, firewalls, like imagine any kind of security system or any kind of networking that we have without a firewall system for our personal use or for our um, corporate usage that, that's there. Like that's so hard to imagine, right? Because we are going to be inundated with all kinds of threats. Think of living in a house without walls or without any kind of security system in place. Uh, needless to say, that creates a vulnerability and it creates a vulnerable, not safe situation, right? So similarly, a life without self-control is susceptible to dangers of excess and unbridled desires. So God calls us to build the walls of temperance around our lives protecting us from the f harmful consequences of unrestrained actions. And while you're listening to me, I highly encourage you to think of one aspect of your life in which you can do a better job uh, in living with temperance. It might not be you know, something related to alcohol, it might not be something related to our drug usage, but it could be the amount of uh, time spent scrolling on our phones. Imagine, uh, it could be uh, time spent on indulging in things that are not productive, you know, going overboard with that. So think of that one area, and I highly you know, encourage you to uh, introspect. What can you do different about it? Because the second aspect of it is um, a lifestyle of temperance. Just like how we spoke about living for uh, the glory of God, it's not a one-time done deal. Living uh, a life of uh, temperance, it's a lifestyle. So in Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, it talks about everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Think of uh, you know, all the athletes going for uh, Olympics or any big uh, sport event. So they, there is constant training and there is, I mean, they, they follow a diet, they, they, they do things to their physical body, that way they are fit and they are able to compete and earn medals. So in this verse, Apostle Paul draws a parallel between discipline required in athletic training and the spiritual discipline of self-control. 
So athletes undergo a rigorous training to achieve a temporary reward. They get that award and that's a done deal. But as followers of Christ, we strive for a heavenly crown that is going to last forever. And this calls for a life of temperance in our choices and our actions. And now, okay, we see the importance of self-control. But where do we get this self-control from? So is it from us? But if it is from us, as uh, Corey Ten Boom said, that's going to be an exhaustive, you know, ridiculous effort on our part, right? Like if it comes from us. But fortunately for us, it does not come from us. Because in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 says um, about the fruit of the Spirit. And self-control or living with temperance is the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, when we yield to the Spirit's guidance, temperance becomes a natural outpouring of God's work within us. So it is through the Spirit that we find the strength to resist the temptations that seek to lead us astray. And there are so many things that can lead us astray, and it's very easy to fall into temptation. But when we depend on God's power to guide us to, from within, then that is going to be uh, in a manner that we can demonstrate self-control as the fruit of the Spirit. And there are so many examples that we see from the Bible about this. Uh, it could be Daniel and Joseph and Esther and Jesus and Paul and John the Baptist, just to name a few. There are so many uh, wonderful and powerful men and women of God who has demonstrated that. So as a conclusion, um, as we conclude, let me ask you the three questions that I asked at the beginning. Who are we? And what are we expected to do? And how should we do it? Let's dedicate our lives to living intentionally for God's glory by embracing our identity in Christ. So reflecting his character in all aspects of our lives is the essence of living for God's glory. And that involves acknowledging our identity in Christ and exercising uh, temperance in our actions, thoughts, and speech. So Deva Mahatvatinde Deva Sambhangalaita, as beacons of God's glory. Deva Snehatinde Parivartana Shaktiye Logatine Velipadpikonda. So let's build the walls of temperance around our hearts, guarding our hearts and our souls and our minds as we pursue the eternal crown that awaits us. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, May God's grace guide us as we live for his glory and embrace our identity in Christ. So may these words bless us and guide us.